Hello and welcome to Landscape Photography World, the podcast for everyone passionate about landscape photography. I'm Grant Swinburne and I'll be your host on this show, talking to landscape photographers about their motivations, likes and dislikes. This week we explore the multifaceted journey of UK-based travel and landscape photographer Jason Rowe. From capturing life's vibrant hues to navigating the complexities of war and displacement, Jason's work is a testament. Jason's work is a testament to his diverse experiences. From his first job at 17 to cruising the world as a ship's photographer and living in Ukraine until the coming of the war, Jason shares his unique perspective on image creation. In this episode, he shares insights into his take on the future of photography with evolving AI technology, how he takes a more considered approach to his photography, along with a lot more. I hope you enjoy the show. G'day, Jason. Welcome to Landscape Photography World. How are you going? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks for inviting me, Grant. It's uh, my first podcast, so I'm looking forward to it. Oh, fantastic. I'm pleased to have popped your podcast cherry then. <laughs> Why don't you start off telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got into landscape photography? Okay. I don't really class myself as a landscape photographer, to be quite honest. I'm, I've yeah, had all I'm kind of a generalist. I probably like a lot of people of our age. I was uh, given a camera for my birthday, my 16th birthday, a film camera, obviously, given my age, and took a few pictures with it and was utterly hooked. Uh, at the age of 16, I, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be a photographer. I had absolutely no idea how I was going to do that. Mm. I got lucky in that I, you've heard of the, the enlarger company called Durst. Yes. Um, yep. Yep. I, I got a job with them when I was 17. Oh, wow. Uh, re- the development department. And basically from there, just went through all the gears, worked on the cruise ships for about 15 years, running photography concessions, and mm-hmm. gave that up in what, 2011. Um, yep. Came back to shore. We, yeah, you may have seen my backstory is that I lived in Ukraine until the war started. Yeah. Um, settled down in Odessa and just set out shooting whatever I felt like shooting, just going off and doing travel shoots, primarily shooting uh, video as well as photos because video stock is where the money is. Um, yeah. And then obviously had to come over here to the UK beginning of 22 because of the war with my wife. And we decided to settle in the Northeast just because of the sheer range of beautiful places we've got up here that I can go out and shoot within 15 minutes of home. Yeah, and fantastic. Really flourished from there. So the photography side of it has come back, whereas for the last few years, I've just concentrated entirely on video just to, because that's what made the money. I'm really back into the photography now. Okay. So what place does photography, and I'm obviously more interested in the landscape photography, but also feel free to talk about any other genres as well. What place does photography have in your life? Without trying to sound cliched, it has been my life. It's it's my happy place. I'm not a particularly outdoorsy sort of person, but I just love being in a beautiful location behind a lens, usually sometime before everybody's got up in the morning, yep. um, nobody around, just me, the camera and what's in front of me. And that's where I'm happiest. And I guess that's what it really means to me. Um, yeah. That's me. That's yeah. just on my own with a camera. Sounds sounds blissful. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It can be. Yeah. Yeah. So when when did it start to become art for you in terms of the landscape stuff? Where you know a lot of people start out, as you say, going to beautiful places and they just take a, a wide angle shot and they're happy with that. And it could be any time of the day. When did it mm-hmm. actually start to be? Oh, I want to go out when the light is at the best, and I really want to make this image something a little bit above just the snapshot. That's a good question. In terms of really wanting to make the images talk, I think probably around 2009, um, I was very lucky enough to to go to Antarctica. Um, I was managing a photography concession on a cruise ship and I had just the most unrivaled access to going ashore. I wasn't limited by the time I could be ashore. I could be ashore all the time. And just those landscapes opened up to me of Antarctica. And I just 
I was just blown away by them, just blown away by them. And I think that's where I started to think I need to concentrate on making this scene in front of me look the very best it can, um, mm. rather than just holding up the camera and saying, well, that looks good. Let's just take that. It was actually starting to really think about the elements within the scenes. And yeah, I think that's probably it. Uh, the, the sort of my first trip down to Antarctica was where I really started to think about landscapes. Yeah, cool. And how did that sort of process of starting to drive down that artistic channel and creativity, where did that sort of passion and what motivates you now, I guess, is another real question that I've got for you. That's a good question again. You know, it's just the final image. It's just being able to see that final image, the concept of what I had in my mind Mm-hmm. Um, on the screen or in a print in front of me is what motivates me. Um, like I said, coming up here, we have so many beautiful places that I can literally not have anything in mind. I can look at the weather one morning or the night yeah. before and, and say, yeah, that's going to be good. There's going to be some mist. There's going to be uh, yeah. some clouds in the sky. And I can just go out at seven, or six, seven o'clock in the morning before anyone's around and get a shot and I know in my mind what I want that shot to achieve it comes to me when I'm on the scene Um, okay I I don't tend to plan anything way way ahead because you just never know whether the the weather's going to play ball or or whatever so it comes to be I I have a list of things that I want to shoot okay and I have a few weather apps and I basically look at the weather apps for the week ahead think okay yeah Wednesday's looking good we'll go and shoot one of those things on the list on Wednesday yeah. And I normally ask that question about where do you fit on the planning to spontaneous spectrum. Yeah, it yeah. sounds like you're around about the middle somewhere. Yeah, yeah, I think probably veering more towards the spontaneous. I do have a list of places I, I, I want to shoot, but I don't research them deeply. I might go into Google Earth and Google yeah, Maps right. and street view and stuff and see what there is but i'm not i don't sit under uh sit in front of the photographer's emeritus whatever ephemeris working out the light angles and that sort of stuff all the time if there's a particular type of shot i've got one shot in mind that i i really do need to use that app to achieve the shot but i in general i wouldn't be using stuff like that so yeah. it's very much yeah because you can get there and the, the sun will be behind a cloud anyway yeah <laughs> it's, it's uh, yeah everyone's technique particularly in the field evolves over time and Mm -hmm. with experience and so forth and the better your camera and your gear and the accessories that you you accumulate along the way Mm -hmm. how do you use that experience to experiment do you experiment in your photography much or is it okay i've got a set routine and this works for me no, I, I do experiment. If I see something that's I don't know, the other day, I was shooting some autumn leaves in the background of a river, and they were backlit. And so you just, in your mind, you need to bring that exposure down to throw that river darker and bring those leaves out. So yeah. you've been around probably as long as I have in this game. You just instinctively know what you need to do after a certain period of time. Yeah, I, it's the stage I can look at the light and probably tell you what the exposure is without an exposure meter. Um, yeah, yeah. Even yeah. Cases, I know I can look at some of the waves at some beaches and go, okay, to get this length of foam, you want a quarter of a second or whatever. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it is, it's that sort of instinct to, to shoot, yeah. to get the shot. That you, You've developed these instincts over well, 40 years in my case now. And, mm. and I think, I hate to say it, but I think coming from a film background gives you such a great grounding in because you had to get it right. And you yeah. had to, uh, you t- particularly if you were taking transparency film, you're half a stop under or over. You've just lost that image. So you needed to know exactly how to get things right in the camera. Yeah. And I suspect we lost that a little bit these days. Yeah. That said, I quite enjoy the use of stopping down and stopping up to give better dynamic range. Some of the dynamic range in some of the cameras now is approaching the human eye but when yeah, when you're in certain conditions as you know you can't always get that full range without 
some kind of bracketing. So I think that's one one reason why I don't think I'll ever go back to film. <laughs> oh no, I'm I'm not hankering for the days of film at all. But yeah, no, um, I, I get where you're coming. Love from. Love digital, but I just still feel that the the days of film gave us that grounding in how a shutter speed will affect the image, how and at the aperture will affect the image, and how the ISO affects the image. That said, I I literally bracket everything I shoot these days, yeah. nearly every shoot is off a tripod and I bracket everything I shoot which is not good for hard drive space but it is good for making sure you've got exactly the right exposure for the vision that you've got of that shot so. yeah yeah I'm very similar I, I do a lot of bracketing a uh, little bit of focus stacking but mostly bracketing for for my shooting as well and as you say it does give you that leverage to nail the exposure right across the the dynamic range that makes yeah, a real difference. Yeah. And, and of course, you can you can HDR it. it. Used to be a dirty word, but I think HDR has come round now to a point where you can create really beautiful images with HDR, yeah. very natural looking images, as opposed to the garish stuff that yeah, the, the really bizarre stuff early there. stuff that was around. Yeah, there was some awful stuff out there. I used to hate HDR, but now I absolutely love it. Yeah. It, it's technique from the days of film where a, a photographer would shoot an under over and a normal exposure and yep. merge them in the enlarger so it's it's yeah. nothing but um, yeah and, that, and it, it, this is what i say to a lot of people that i've spoken to in workshops and so forth is that most of the technique is they say oh, i want to try and get it right in camera and i said what you're actually saying is you're leaving it to the camera manufacturer or the software manufacturer right. for the camera manufacturer hired to yeah. set your your creative vision what yeah, you need yeah. to do is actually look at editing as the dark room and it's no different yeah. to what used to happen back in the film days 99 percent of bar the ai stuff that's creeping in now in yeah. photoshop and lightroom 99 percent of what you can do in lightroom and photoshop is exactly what you can do in the dark room yeah. Oh, no, I 100%. I, I always, when people say I, I, I get it, um, I always try to get it right in the camera. Did you, I, I'd, I'd love to have a look at Ansel Adams negatives because they yeah. are going to look nothing like yeah. the prints that yeah. or his printer put out, but he used to spend hours briefing his printer and working with his printer to get those images. Exactly. Um, the, 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 the fact is that the, the negative or the digital negative is just the template. It's the template of what it's we want. It's your starting to point. From, yeah. You know, <laughs> and that's exactly what I try to communicate is that you've got to get yeah. yourself a good base starting point. Yes, you yeah. don't want blown highlights and ultra black shadows what you want some detail in those shadows you want your highlights to be visible and sometimes that does mean taking multiple shots to get a across that dynamic range so you can get what you yeah. want yeah. so what sort of things are you mentioned trying to express some kind of story around the the image and the place mm -hmm. that you're in what kind of story is it that you're trying to express and what sort of things are you expressing through your photography i think i i try to express the beauty of things I, I do some darker stuff but most of my photography if you look through my website it has this sort of saturated colorful feel to it yeah um and i just try to i've suffered not deeply from depression i get some fairly deep ups and downs and sure. photography for me is a way of just bringing out the color in life even on the gray days just bringing out the color in life and and i think that's what my photography actually expresses I, that that said i quite enjoy doing a bit of sort of gritty realism and stuff like that but i'll always come back to trying to convey nature or even the beauty of a city in its color and its di dynamism yeah, um, so that, yeah. that's where my sort of heart lies in that sort of aspect. yeah I, like, I certainly like a lot of what you do and in particular some of those grittier images some of your street photography sort of stuff is is quite mm -hmm. interesting because it is a little bit edgier and a little bit out there from the the rolling green hills of Cumberland mm -hmm. or yeah. Northumberland or so forth how would you describe your style in terms of where it started and where it's going 
I, it started from nowhere. It, I just didn't have a style. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody really did. Uh, and that was for many years, I think. I think it's only once we, once uh, my wife and I, we worked together on the cruise ships of photographers. And when I got off and we settled down, and I started to look through what I'd captured in the years of traveling. Uh, I started to identify that sort of color, colorful style um, that a lot of my images had. Mm -hmm. um, so that's developed and I've continued that. And I, I still enjoy that, that colorful, saturated, l full of life uh, style. But I'm definitely moving towards some darker stuff now, some sort of more gritty realism. Yeah. Uh, it's great living up here because not only have we got this beautiful scenery and stunning cathedrals and cities, but we've got that gritty northern industrial aspect to it as well, which yeah. you know, the, the beauty and the sort of functionality of the bridges in Newcastle just absolutely inspire me. They're both beautiful and somewhat derelict and neglected. And I just love trying to portray both of those in the same image yeah. so you've got the the template actually the, the the practice run for the sydney harbour bridge there in newcastle haven't you we we have indeed same company that built it and right. that, that, uh, i've been corrected a few times about that it wasn't the template in fact no, the, the sydney bridge was actually <laughs> they're not exactly first. the same either <laughs> they are pretty much the same yeah yeah the weather's a bit different but, so yeah, the view's a little bit different and the the time's a little bit narrower i think than the uh, definitely the yeah but uh, e equally stunning locations i think oh so. absolutely absolutely and i guess you've also got uh quite a lot of historical buildings uh there i know in and around the north of England, the number of historical sites that are there. I, yeah. I, I'm quite into that sort of photography myself and finding interesting sort of little details in some of the things that you might find. It might be a Roman ruin or a medieval cathedral or something, and there's just these little architectural things that you go, wow, somebody did that 2,000 or 1,000 or you know, 500 years yeah. ago. My go-to location is Durham Cathedral, and there is an iconic sort of chocolate box shop that I keep going back to. But every time I go back to it, I try to represent it in a slightly different way, trying just to avoid a little bit of uh, the chocolate box imagery. imagery. Oh, yeah. It's just such, it's just one of those locations that there's very few places I've been to in the world where I go back to, would, would go back to again and again, just because of the sheer beauty of the place. Mm. And uh, this, it's in front of the cathedral and it just, every time it gets me, just beautiful location to, to see. Yeah. yeah. You made the choice, obviously, to become a photographer very early on. Mm. Uh, and, and from the sounds of it, it was a calling rather than a distinct, career choice going through yeah. career advisor or whatever that a lot of people go through to to find their way in life how have you balanced that part of your life with the rest of your life or is it out of balance Can be. No, it's, you know what it defines my life it's if i'm not shooting for professional reasons i'm often shooting for personal reasons it, it's it, it i can't separate my regular life from my photographic life they're, they're basically the same thing yeah i'm always tinkering with a photo or posting a picture that i really like up on social media or or whatever it's always there it's always part of my life how do you with your commercial stuff how do you maintain your sort of creative vision and your artistic view of the world while also catering to what the client demands are because what the client wants and what's possible are not always the same but also how do you drive for something that the that the client actually wants delivered to be honest i don't really have clients that uh, commission my work okay. um you know, most of my work is sold um i used to sell through micro stock but I, i've given up that i'll only sell through uh alamy and macro stock or okay. by selling prints or by teaching online courses that i have a number of available um and stuff like that so i don't really have any constraints if you like i'm not when i in previous lives i, I used to have to work constrained to what a client wanted but now i'm utterly free to, to shoot whatever i want and i know what prints are going to sell uh, yep. because social media is a great thing for that if something gets loads and loads of likes people are going to buy it yeah. um, you know, and so i if i'm looking to 
shoot something with making some money in mind out of it. I will just follow what social media demands, if you like, but not necessarily constrained by it. Stock is very different, obviously. Stock photography, you never know what's going to sell in stock photography, to be honest. You literally, I've had stuff that I think is incredibly bland, sell multiple times, and stuff that I think is just absolutely stunning, never sells. That You just put a finger up in the air and just wait to see what's going to sell with stock photography, which is exciting because it gives you the ability to just experiment constantly and just put your best pictures up. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm interested in your time in Ukraine. What drove the choice to move there to Odessa in the first place? Well, that was quite simple. I married a Ukrainian. Oh, okay. um, we worked together on cruise ships. Uh, Tanya was uh, working in the casino of a yep. cruise ship that I was working on, and I used to set up the photo studio in the casino on yeah. formal nights. And, uh, yeah, we just got chatting, and she had a bit of an interest in photography, and we took it from there. She, I ma- managed to sway the my company to give her a job as a photographer and yeah we spent five years together on cruise ships uh, as photographers no we got to a point where we can't do this for the whole of our lives what should we do we decided to settle in odessa because my my work is uh, particularly the sort of video and photo stock it's all done online so i'm not tied down to a particular location or anything like that um the cost of living was so much better there we could buy ourselves a nice little apartment and um, have a good life there so Mm. that's where I went it's a beautiful city as well which helps yeah I was going to ask how did you find the shooting around that area because I guess certainly in the western media you don't see a lot of sort of eastern European photography there's a little you get a smattering but you don't see a lot of it um, and it's only when you go into places like 500 pixels or, or, or whatever that you, you start to see some of that stuff. But what were the locations like and what did you enjoy about shooting there? Uh, there's Odessa itself is just has the most stunning city centre. It's unlike anything in Eastern Europe. It, it was actually built by Italian and French architects. So it's got this really beautiful Mediterranean feel to it. Mm. also has what I regard as possibly the most beautiful opera house in the world. I'm sure people in Vienna will be shouting at me, but I think it's it was actually designed by the might, same might people. Might be some people in Sydney argue about that one too. <laughs> well, yeah, different styles. Though. Very yeah, different style, I know. <laughs> this was a very classic, the neoclassical style opera house um, and was actually, I believe, built by the, or designed by the same architects that did the Vienna Opera House. Yeah, right. And it's just the most stunning location to shoot. It's just really beautiful fountains to the side of it. And just a place, it's one of those go-to places. You always go back to it and try and shoot it in a different way. And um, Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the the city centre of Odessa um, is just stunning. It it was during the war. It's been made a a UNESCO World Heritage Centre for its architecture. And... um, Beyond that, there's not a lot of great sort of landscape scenery on the outside. It's very flat. It's very agricultural. You can drive through literally hundreds of miles of sunflower seed fields and um, that sort of stuff. Um, But the city itself and also other cities such as Kiev and um, Lviv, beautiful, beautiful cities for photography, really stunning places. Cool. And getting out when the war came, were you early in moving or was it something that you stuck around to wait and see what happened? No, I was actually back in the UK. Um, I was sorting out some family business uh, and I came to the UK middle of January um, to sort it out and um, with plans to go back. And I was going to be about months in the UK, two, three months uh, in the UK and then go back. There had been this sort of impending doom um, over the last couple of months. We knew something was brewing, but we didn't think he was going to go all the way. We thought yeah. he might try and take the Donbass again, expand that or whatever. Uh, so I was in the UK. I was um, shooting. I just literally wasn't sleeping. I was every time, every morning I'd wake up at four o'clock in the morning. I was look at the news. And then on, I think it was the 24th, yeah. it was it happened and i immediately got on whatsapp to my wife tanya and um i said it started you need to get out and she's like it's it's going to be okay but she didn't see 
because she was in the city, she didn't see what was actually going on. Yeah, I, right. uh, we both know that Russia wanted Odessa. And yeah. it was quite obvious to me that they were going to come for Odessa as soon as they could, in yeah, which absolutely. case she would have been cut off and, and stuck there. And who knows what would have happened. So yeah. we we basically spent that whole day on WhatsApp. And I was saying, you need to get down to your mum's. Um, her mum lives in a little town called Ismail, which is on the Romanian ukrainian border on the danube yep. i said you need to get down there um, we had four cats that we had to deal with um all the stuff of life our entire life was in our little apartment in odessa so she had a, a, her a horrendous sort of 36 hours sorting that out fortunately we got friends to come in and live with our cats and that she went down to ismail and we decided that I would fly out to in Romania. Yep. I have some Romanian friends who would get her out of Ukraine. They went up to the border crossing and got her out of Ukraine. Um, basically, we reunited in Bucharest on, I think, the 6th of March. Okay. And then we actually had to Airbnb in it until the UK government issued the visa, which was about a month later. Um, yeah, right. got some right. UK visa. And then we came back lived in london for a while my my father had passed away the year before so we were in the process of selling his house so we had that as a place to live once that was sold we came up north and bought our own little place up here okay wow quite quite a tale it was so yeah it's been the last sort of 18 months have just been non-stop it's just been a challenge yeah. I took all my cameras to Bucharest and I didn't take them out of the bag once. It was yeah. just, it wasn't in my mind to shoot. And her so. family and everything, they're all okay? Yeah. Odessa now is relatively safe. You still yeah. got bombs going over and these shy drones and all that. Um, her mum moved up to um, our, our apartment at Odessa for a while. She's been up there yeah, a few right. months after our apartment and our one one remaining cat unfortunately two of them have passed over mm -hmm. the rainbow bridge since we've been away which is sad but uh, one of them we went in august we drove to ukraine or rather tanya flew into ukraine via moldova and i drew, drove to the ukrainian border and yeah. we pulled out our first cat and drove it back across europe so yeah i i, I uh, Tanya needed to be in Odessa for sort of two or two and a half weeks. So I thought, I'm going to drive across Europe. I will stop off in some nice places, do some photography, do some filming. Sure, sure. And so I went down to Frankfurt and to Nuremberg and then over to Krakow, which was gorgeous. And yeah. They're just for a road trip. And then we had a, like a basically a 36 hour dash across Europe to get the cat back into the UK. So, <laughs> yeah. Blimey. <laughs> Yeah, it was a it was a challenge, but there's there's these adventures that you'll look back on in your life. Oh, so. definitely, definitely. I'm always interested in where you shoot and how that in, impacts on not necessarily what you shoot, because obviously if you're shooting your local area and you've already mentioned a couple of spots there around the traps, but I'm interested in how it might influence how you shoot and the techniques that you're using. Do you think that is had any influence moving to where you are now had any influence on changing the way that you shoot yes i think so actually i'm a much more i'm taking a much more considered approach to to photography i'm not i wouldn't say i preconceived because I don't I have a rough idea in my mind what I want to achieve sure, sure. But, um, but um I've slowed down because I have time now I'm not constantly worrying about trying to make money from video stock and traveling around and sh Europe or whatever and shooting video stock I, yeah. I, I have the time now to just do it my own way like I said earlier I think nearly every shot I take now is taken from a tripod everything is more considered more not a structured approach, but a slower approach to everything. Yeah. I still take loads of pictures and I'll take loads of angles, but it'll all be done with, I think what I'm trying to say is I really, I'm about the image quality now, much more about yeah, the, right. the, quality of the image that's coming out yeah. of the camera than just trying to get the shot. It's all about making sure that everything's pin sharp, that the exposure's spot on, the histogram's not clipping, yeah. Um, and just getting everything perfect in the camera so that I've got the perfect negative, digital negative to work with when I bring it back to Lightroom or whatever I'm using. So, yeah, okay. But yeah, that's where I, I most definitely have changed. And I had the opportunity to, there was a quite a well known YouTuber, director of photography, that was selling some of his gear. 
and amongst it was a Fuji GFX 50S. Okay. Uh, going for several hundred pounds cheaper than you could buy one second hand on the camera stores. And I knew, I know I've followed this guy for a long time, so I knew it had been well looked after. And yeah. so I offered him the full amount and I bought it. And the, I've just absolutely, I, I had had absolute buyer's regret the moment I sent him the money. <laughs> and that's absolutely evaporated since I've been using it. Because yeah. I, I wrote an article actually recently about the image quality thing. And I've, there's only two cameras that I've really ever felt that gave me that film, real film look. The first was the D3, the Nikon yep. D3, because it was at a time when all the other camera manufacturers were pushing 24, 18, 24 megapixels. Yep. Nikon said, no, we're staying with 12. We're going to make those the best 12 megapixels you've ever seen. And yeah. the quality that came out of that camera was just sublime. And I hadn't had anything like that until I got this GFX 50. The files are just so beautiful. The tonal range, the contrast, the color contrast. Uh, and it's been an absolute revelation buying that secondhand camera. Um, yeah. and, and I think that's what's, I, I was driven to buy it because of my desire to get that really beautiful image quality. And I've have had absolutely no regrets in actually getting that camera. Oh, fantastic. Other than Durham Cathedral, do you have a favourite spot, one that just keeps pulling you back? Havana. I was lucky enough to go there quite a few times. And um, it is an absolute photographer's playground. It's the colour, the people. You can take pictures of people. You don't have this fear of asking somebody to take their picture and then say, no, leave me alone. It's, yeah. I'll have my picture taken with you. It's just the openness of the people, the colour, the the contrast of the old cars and the old buildings and people walking along with modern mobile phones, but 1950s cars in the background, that contrast and colour and energy of the city is just uh, a place that uh, really draws to me. And I, I'd love to go back. I've been probably about five or six times in the sort of uh, early 2000s and 2010, 2011 onwards a little bit, but I haven't been back for about 10 years. So that's definitely a place I'd like to go back to. Cool. Sounds, sounds marvellous. Um, it is an amazing it's place. It's definitely yeah. on my list. It's uh, one that I haven't got to yet. but uh, oh, you should def Definitely uh, give it a go because it is such a stunning. And even if you get outside of Havana, the, the countryside is absolutely stunning as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you could retire at one of the places you've shot, which would it be? It would be Odessa. Okay. It's always, it's my home. It's my wife's home. It's, there's always photography be, to be done there. And yeah. that's where I would want to, to to spend the rest of my days. It's um, the contrast again. It, it reminds me a little bit of Havana. And you've got these amazing contrasts of sort of these Soviet buildings and this sort of 19th century yeah. Italian architecture. The, the brutalist versus the Italian classical. Right? Yeah, yeah. And both of them are have their own sort of beauty. I love the brutalist architecture, not the bland stuff, but the real sort of landmark stuff. Yeah. The absolutely incredible. Um, so, yeah, Odessa has been my home and hopefully will continue to be my home and the place that I wish to retire to. And I certainly hope you do get back there. Ah, thanks. I think we will, but it's going to take a little time, unfortunately. Yeah, just, just a bit, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 What's your most memorable experience in photography? Machu Picchu, I think. Okay. Uh, in, we we couldn't get on the ship's tour, so we had to do it ourselves, and we had to yeah. do it in a two-and-a-half-day time frame, which basically meant flying from Lima to uh, Cusco and then taking yeah. a 95 mile taxi ride to a train station and then a train arriving at uh, one o'clock in the morning getting up at five o'clock in the for the same morning and going up into the the park yeah. and then shooting the hell out of it um, and yeah. uh, yeah, we were there when the gates opened, so there were no other people in the actual Machu Picchu itself. So the clouds were rolling over the hills, and mm. um, yeah, just an absolutely magical photographic experience, and uh, yeah. one that absolutely sticks in my mind. I think. Yeah, no, it's a fantastic place. So uh, that that is one on my bucket list that I have tick, ticked off. Um, yeah, we is. we were lucky to spend a couple of nights in Agua Caliente, uh, Caliente yeah. which is uh, yeah. down at the bottom. And yeah. went up for the sunrise, which, to be honest, the, the, the light wasn't that great. It was a bit cloudy and it just didn't 
yeah. it just didn't pop. But the afternoon before, we actually were with a tour group and then we got a bit of free time at the end and it was literally just before the park was closing mm. and the sun was just dipping behind the, the the mountains there in the west and just got this lovely side light coming in off the the, the sides of the, the peaks there and it was just, and the buildings and everything, it was just magical. It was wonderful. It, it is. And, and the, the setting that it's in is just... Oh, um, yeah. Second like, and I've never yeah. seen anything like and like I said I've been to Antarctica and, and that's stunning in its own right but Machu Picchu we were very unlucky with the light in the but I can say unlucky that it was overcast and low cloud all the time that we were there yeah and we were just at the end of a flooding of the what's the name of the river that goes through I forget the name uh, um, okay uh, the Orobamba that's um, it yeah. we, we they'd only reopened the railway the day before so the we went down after our sort of i think eight or nine hours in in the site itself and the arabamba river was in absolute full flood and yeah, it wow. was just raging torrents so i grabbed the, the video camera tanya had been filming in machu picchu and i've been taking stills and i grabbed the video camera and i just shot this arabamba river and I'm not kidding you, the 10 minutes that I stood there filming it have been the best selling stock video that I've ever shot. Yeah, They've nice. still, nice. I sold two yesterday. It, it, it's paid for the camera four times over. Oh, wow. <laughs> just 10 shots. And you just think to yourself, I wish I could repeat something like that. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. What about horror stories? Everyone's had a, uh, a shocker once or twice in their life. Have you had anything go badly wrong? Not particularly. The working on the cruise ships was always good fun because particularly in the my first part, the the, the early early to late nineties, it was all film based. Yeah. Um so you will always um had this possibility of screwing up. I never really did anything really that really screwed up, but I did have an assistant um who for some bizarre reason decided to check the chemicals in our film processor just as six rolls of a german passenger's uh, personal films were going through it holy and as the manager of the concession it was left to me to explain quite how that had happened which wasn't the easiest thing to do and he's he's first of all his english wasn't particularly great and secondly he was extraordinarily angry about what had happened right. basically compensate him and give him basically all the shots that we had taken through the chip but i said you can have copies and all that but uh, but yeah that was a pretty nasty horror story wow. had a had a nikon f4 stolen on a cruise ship as well that okay. was pretty, wow. i was it was literally the night i i I'd, been out in Rome I'd have come back to the ship and I'd got a, a, a tele, telex it was in those days it wasn't an email yep. that said oh you're being transferred to Miami tomorrow morning at seven o'clock so I just an absolute faff I had just running around and sometime in that confusion somebody decided to steal my Nikon F4 wow uh, so I, I turned up at this uh next ship in Miami the next morning without my cameras which was uh bit of a horror story but uh, um, definitely but yeah not too many horror stories that's me. good what's the practice of photography taught you about the world patience i think it's taught me it's a tricky question the photography taught me about the world it's taught me the beauty of the world i think mm. and, and the reality of the world the contrasts how you can be taking a, an absolutely beautiful scene and then move I don't know, three or four meters to the right and seeing the, the dereliction of somebody's life, needles yep. or whatever in, in a bush. I think it, it, you, you wouldn't see that a normal person walking by, but as a photographer that's constantly looking for something, both the beauty and the, the ugly side of, of life in a few square meters at the same location. Mm, okay. What does success look like for you in photography? And it doesn't have to be financial success. I think it's the success is if people like your pictures. Okay. If somebody says, yeah, I really like that picture, then that's a success. You I know, think that's it, a great answer. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 to me, it's as simple as that. And if somebody goes beyond that and says, that's absolutely fantastic, then yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll take that. And I'd like to say you know, we spend a lot of time crafting our art, but the average person doesn't actually see no, that's all invisible. Into a photograph. But if they like it, 
I don't care if they know how much time I've spent on creating that image or not. If they like it, then I'm happy. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. That, that's, it. that's it, I think. Yeah, no, nobody sees the fuel bills or the airline tickets or the... I don't know, of course you know, the, not. The yeah. time like, spent hiking <laughs> up and just to... <laughs> yeah, it's, that it's, no, it's, yeah, exactly. Or just the, the the fact that it was your experience and knowledge that allowed you to capture that image. Yeah, it's, in in the way that you have captured it. Yeah, um, I think it's uh, we're at we're at a point where you have to keep taking more and more striking images, and we're I think we're in an era where unfortunately a striking image is often better light than a well-composed image. Um, yeah, I've I got to say, I've seen some technically awful images. Yeah, yeah. Garnish, and even some of I'm putting my hand up here saying some of my techni- technical horrors, they're not technically right. <laughs> you know what? I might have stuck it up on Instagram five or six years ago or whatever, and it just went off and yeah yeah, yeah, so yeah. You, you just can't predict and then there's others that i know i've put everything into making sure that it's as perfect as can be and it got gets nowhere near the the, the same amount of uh interest yeah it, it can be a little bit demoralizing but um <laughs> you know, the, the 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 fact is you go out you continue taking as many pictures as you like and just uh you you just accept that sometimes people like striking images over yeah. beautiful images what we would consider beautiful images how has your relationship with social media changed over the years obviously back in the day it was a little bit easier to gain a following and the way instagram in particular has moved more towards video and that mm. competition with tiktok how has your relationship with the various social media platforms out there changed it's I actually have been picking up the following in the last sort of two years, more or less since I've been back in the UK. I had reasonable following on Facebook page, about 4,000 people or so. Twitter, I had 300 people. But I noticed that on Twitter, people really got engaged if they could put their own photos up. So I started doing these showcases. I was copying other photographers that were doing the same thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That it was my own original idea, but I, I did that solidly every day for a year, and I built from I think three hundred to sixteen thousand okay. um, over that period of time. And they're all pretty engaged um, followers. They're not you lose some, you gain some, but they generally I uh, stick up a morning post every morning, and I still get a hundred and hundred and fifty people liking it, commenting on it. And, yeah. yeah. Um, since I've been putting a lot of a post to a, fair, a few groups that are specific about photo, not photography, but the beauty of Britain, and um, they get really high engagement. So I invite them to my page, and yeah, I've added right. about three thousand to the page in the last sort of six months. Okay, um, cool. grinded and grinded and grinded for years and years, and it's never gone anywhere. I've tried reels. I've had reels. That I've had a thousand likes, hundred comments. And I might have got two new followers out of it. So Instagram is, when I do my social media posts in the morning, it's always the last one I post to. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I think it's lost its relevance in photography these days, to be honest. Yeah, I'm really interested with the growth of uh, in threads or Mm -hmm. Instagram threads, as they call it, (laughs) which is obviously a Twitter knockoff. Yeah. But it's interesting seeing that grow into something that I think Instagram probably could have transformed into had yeah yeah it wanted to. I just find it's a it's a strange move to split it off into a another platform that everyone's got to engage with and take time out. That, that's the thing that I struggle with is I'm running a number of accounts on the sort of the big three, Twitter, Instagram and, and Facebook, but I'm also running Vero and yeah, Threads nice. and a, a couple of others. Yeah. But, yeah, it's I, I just find it interesting the way that they've made that move and I, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on it. I think Threads is it's literally got nothing to do with us. I think it's just Zuckerberg and Musk show oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think it's just, chest. yeah that's it yeah exactly it's just um, zuckerberg yeah you've got twitter you bought twitter i'll bring something out i've got the money to do it 
Yeah. And that said, I'm not, I, I got in it on the first day and, and yep. I didn't go anywhere. But I've been posting the last few months every day and I'm literally just copying my Twitter post to the threads. And uh, my audience is going up. My followership is, I think, up to about 600 now from about 30. It languished about 30 for the first few few weeks. And, yeah, um, right. right. I, it's growing. And the engagement there, the irony is that I can, I, I put the identical post on Twitter, or X as it's called now, and yep. threads. And with five, 600 followers on threads, I will get double the engagement that I do on X. Yeah. So that, you know, that encourages me. I think it's got a long way to go. There, there's, uh, yeah, I don't think you can put video on it at the moment. And it doesn't hashtag. do video. There's, and there's also no hashtags, which, yeah. you know, in a lot of cases isn't a bad thing either. Yeah, uh, having seen some of the hashtags trending this morning, <laughs> I'd be inclined to agree with you. But, yeah. And, and I, I tried Vera. I just couldn't get on with that. It's just, like, it confuses uh, me. It's um, yeah, my, my issue with it is the bugs in the Android app because I'm on right, Android. Right. And to be honest, it's... I'm, I persevere with it just to try and engage, though I've noticed the engagement there has dropped off. And I think part of the problem is that, yeah, it's still in beta and, yes, they've still got work to do to fix some of the issues that they've got. And they fixed a couple of them. But there's just weird stuff. If you do an app mention of somebody in your post mm -hmm. and edit further into your post, the little blue highlight disappears, which means the app actually doesn't work. Oh, so you've people. got to then go back and edit that yeah. app and pick the person again so it will go blue and then you can hit post and, and, and send it. And it's yeah, just yeah, yeah. little wrinkles like that just make it frustrating to use. And yeah, I guess that yeah. I'm I'm considering whether or not I continue with it or not. I'm still getting some engagement there. Uh, but yeah. it certainly dropped from where it started off. There was quite a buzz when it first kicked off. Then it went dead again, and then it came back to life about a year or so later, or eighteen months later, and then it's I can see it slowly dropping back off again. So okay, yeah, I'm yeah. just not sure how that's how that's going to go. Yeah, it it is it's tricky to know where to to put all your eggs, really. It, yeah, well, um, that's why I, I, I scatter gun. <laughs> yeah, um, I I think for me at the moment um, is. Is, is reserved for people that potentially buy prints. I'm putting my work out there and people saying, oh, I love that. I invite them to my page. And they, yeah, the prints and calendars do okay on, on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. As long as uh, you can get the following. As long as you Sorry, can get the shop working. It's not like, a nightmare. And then the problem is you, if you use external links in any social media, it just... Yeah, it just plummets your... dumps the, uh, the engagement down. But, um, but yeah, I think Facebook's the place for that. Uh, and Twitter is very much... A lot of my followers on Twitter are very good amateur photographers, enthusiast photographers, and, you know, quite a few professionals as well. Um, so that sort of um, is reserved for the courses and the educational side. Yeah. Uh, because I've got courses out there and I'm setting up this uh, learn center, if you like, on my website where people can learn from me either directly or online. And, yeah, awesome. uh, so I think that's where that audience lies. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about what you do when you come home from a shoot. Are you straight into editing or do you let them marinate for a while and uh, get into them later on? No, I'm just straight away. It's I first of all, it's religious for me to the images I pack them up, yeah, and, and then I I just want to see what I've got. So I'm I'm straight into it. I don't really think too much about the editing process. I just if I see something that's got a little bit of blue light in it, a little bit colder, I'll think, yeah, okay, we'll go a little bit cold on that one. And yep. I'll just crack on and, and do it. And I don't even rate them half the time. I usually rate them about two or three days after I've edited them, which is <laughs> probably not the best way to do things. But but yeah, no, I, I always want to see what I've got. So yeah, a cup of tea, a cup of coffee and Lightroom. Yeah. That's the process. Fair enough. And is it all Lightroom or are you Lightroom Photoshop or Lightroom some other tool? Uh, I, I dabble with Photoshop. I'm, I'm quite lucky lucky in that because I'm an Adobe stock contributor, I submit a lot of video to them. They give Lightroom and Photoshop away to their top contributors. So I get nice. it for free. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
So yeah, I do tend to, there are things that uh, you can do in Photoshop that you can't do in uh, uh, Lightroom, the separation of the layers and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, but I'd say it's probably 95% Lightroom and then another 5% Photoshop. Uh, yeah, cool. I dabbled with Capture One because obviously I'm a Fuji shooter. There is well-known issues with X-Trans sensors and Lightroom. I found a few people on YouTube that come up with some good suggestions that basically when you import your Fuji RAWs, you turn the detail down to zero and the worms go away. You don't want to be sharpening stuff on import anyway. So no, it's, God, no. <laughs> it kind of makes sense. So I've, I've sharpening is the last thing I do to an image and it depends exactly. on what I'm doing exactly. it for. Am I doing it for print or am I doing it for the, the, the web? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't have that problem with the GFX files okay. because it's not an X-Trans sensor. Um, yeah, yeah. Now Lightroom, uh, it's... I started off on Aperture, which I absolutely love, Apple Aperture, uh, and I was okay. so angry when they got rid of that. It was such a waste of uh, a really good program. I still think to this day that it had the potential to be better than Lightroom is now. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. They didn't with it. Um, but yeah, Light, Lightroom is, is where I, I do 95% of my work. What kind of time would you put into an image? It can be anything from a few seconds to a few hours. Okay. Uh, there, there's, no, there's no set. There's some images that you can boost the contrast a little bit, blacks, whites, a little bit of highlights, add a little yep. bit of saturation, desaturate it, touch of clarity, and it's done. And then there's other images where you look at them and think, oh, I need to spend some time on this. this I need to take a bit of some work work. and drop some grab masks and to pick out the subject eliminate the sky there's some images i can spend hour an hour on and, and other images that i can have looking great in in a few seconds so yeah, yeah there's no time limits i think what about when things aren't going your way and you've got a creative block or you've you're sitting there going oh, i don't really feel it today what do you do to get yourself out of the funk it's a good question because it happens uh, happens a lot. I'm sure mm. a lot of photographers, particularly if you do it as a job, a lot of photographers have that. I just basically, I, I look at the weather. I look at the weather apps and I think about if there's going to be a nice stormy sky or something like that, I think I'm going to go out that day regardless. And I'll, I'll set my I'll set several alarms for four or five o'clock in the morning, depending on the time of year. And I will just get up and go it's the, the great thing I, I love shooting pre-dawn pre-dawn it's my favorite time of day and the great thing is you can't look out the window and be discouraged because it's dark yeah yeah so you've got to go and you've got to wait and see what appears you're, you're committed before you uh, know what it's going to be like yeah. exactly you can't be deterred by the weather unless it's hammering down with rain or whatever but yeah. um, you, you're not deterred by the weather because you can't see what it is so you go and then you theme what you're going to shoot towards the light that you you're given basically so, yeah what do you see as being the biggest challenge for photography right now i think the obvious answer is ai mm. uh, a lot of people have said that yeah i think I don't know how big a challenge it's going to be uh, because I, I did write an article for Light Stalking about this and I came back to the core of what photography is and it's Cartier-Bresson's The Decisive Moment yep. and you're never going to have that with AI. Um, it, you can take a picture that will only ever happen once in your lifetime, in anybody's lifetime. I, I have a shot, um, which is quite well known, of a cruise ship in front of an iceberg yep. um, in Antarctica. And it's, I mean, it's been stolen so many times. I've, I've given up chasing it these days. <laughs> but it's never going to happen again. That particular scene will never, ever happen again. And you can yeah. imagine it from AI. But yes, that didn't happen in AI. Um, That's right. Yeah. And, I, and I think the, the, the other issue with AI at the moment is it's not really AI. It's other people's work being amalgamated into what a an algorithm thinks it should look like. And yeah. that I think is morally wrong, completely morally wrong. Um, legally, I think it's dubious um, because you're not giving permission for that work to be used. Um, it's just scraping the internet for them. Yep. Um, so yeah, I think that we're at a very early stage of, what needs to a very early stage of a, a situation needs to be managed very carefully yeah yeah totally agree the for me 
I, I've dabbled a little bit in it just to see what it can do. And, mm. and it's constantly evolving and changing. And I use AI tools in the production of this podcast, but that's yeah. more around yeah. words and transcription and a, a couple of other tools for that. But when it comes to image creation and photography, the murkiness of the ownership for me is the bit that I'm struggling mostly with. That point around where's the learning for the machine come from in the first yeah. place? Yeah. Plus yeah. then, okay, who wrote the algorithm? And if it's some of the open source stuff, who's still writing the algorithms? And if the machine learning has been set up in such a way that the algorithm is evolving on its own, yeah. who who owns it? And then you've got the machine itself in the middle of it all going, I'm the one actually generating the images. And yes, you can be very clever with the words that you type into a, a prompt to ask it to do something to get hmm. what you want, but that's effectively all you've done in my yeah. mind. Everything yeah, no, else you're I, leaning 100%. on. Yeah, you're leaning on the talents of potentially millions of other people to get yeah. you what you've asked for. That kind of leads me on to another aspect um, that worries me about photography uh, at the moment is the loss of technique, understanding technique, because we're getting to a stage now um, where cameras are so good, you don't need to have technique. Now, you, you need to have a compositional eye. Some people have it, some people don't. Uh, it can be taught. I, I kind of lament the loss of people not understanding why, why their camera is producing that image, why that water is blurred, why that um, leaf is in focus and the background is out of focus. People not understanding that. And I think that is a huge loss to photography. Oh, yeah. And and I can see, uh, again, I, I wrote an article quite a while ago where I, I can see a point where AI will be incorporated into cameras to give people an idea of where the composition should be. Yeah. And where yeah. does that leave us? It's where does our genuine creativity come into things when a camera is literally telling somebody what to shoot? And I don't yeah. think that's far off. And we'll see that in five years' time. Oh, that um, you'll have a um, display yeah. in, in, the, in the, the viewfinder on the LCD that says, oh, we should go for a rule of thirds on this one. Try and put that tree just over there. And I, I don't think that's far off, unfortunately. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, I think that'll be a terrible loss to photography. I totally agree. I, I, as I say, compositional techniques and rule of thirds, yada, yada, all of those things can be mm. taught and you do yeah. learn them. But I think, as you said, the eye for actually looking at a scene and then deciding what you're going to put in the frame and yeah. how far into the scene am I actually going to place my frame? Am I yeah. zooming in on a tiny detail or am I zooming right out to, to get the whole panorama? Yeah, and that decision making really comes down to the skill, the creativity, and the decisions that the person is going to make. And if a camera is yeah. telling you what to do, then it's kind of, as you say, it just starts to get a little bit okay. <laughs> Again, who's I, yeah, uh, and the problem I foresee with that is that we will just, and we see it, we're seeing it already. We will just get a never-ending stream of identical pictures. Yeah, homogenized. This is yeah, you know. yeah. They'll all look more or less the same. Yeah, the lighting will be a bit different, but the compositions will be the same, and there'll there'll be no creativity. Which I mean, if you look at it in the, in a more positive point of view, that will make the good photographers stand out because their images will be different. Um, Absolutely, we can take a positivity from that. So. Yeah. What do you see as the future of photography? You talked a little bit about it there, but what, what do you see in, in general? Where do you see photography going? I think it's always going to be around and there's always going to be good photographers because it's not about taking pictures. It's about the process of creating an image. Yeah. It's about... I can sit here and I can type into this laptop a uh, stunning scene, mountain valley in a jungle with elephants walking through, and it'll pop it up for me. Yep. But the real thing about a photographer is they want to be there. 
They want to go to a location that inspires them and they want to capture that location. Again, going back to Cartier-Bresson's decisive moment, the moment yep. that wave comes over, the moment that cloud just pops a little bit of light through on the cathedral or whatever, that absolute moment that will never, ever be repeated. The world is so infinitely variable that we can always find something new to capture. And I think that's where photography will not die out. It will continue going because we're the ones that are going to be there to capture that. Absolutely. Absolutely. What do you like to do when you're not out shooting? I'm a bit of a gamer. Yeah, I like city building games, strategy games on the computer and stuff like that. I've just taken up model railroading last, last oh, wow. week. Okay. Yeah, just I needed something for the winter. It's, hey. uh, it's not always going to be ideal shooting conditions up here. And I just needed something new to, to divert my attentions a little bit. Yeah, gaming and model railroading at the moment. But, uh, cool. I'm sure cool. that will change at some stage. <laughs> So in the model railway roading, are you uh, building out a, a whole room or is it just a, a small portable or more portable setup? It's, um, I've got a six by four board at the moment that I've just started. So I've got a, I don't want to go all in because it's not exactly a cheap hobby. No. Um, no. I want to build a, a six by four layout, a couple of parallel tracks and a couple of locos and bit of scenery and i'm just learning how to create the scenery and put it all in place and that's that's that it's that creative process again you have a vision of what you want to achieve only it's on a piece of board with some railway tracks and some locomotives yeah. and uh, so i'm starting small and if i enjoy that then i will probably rip all that up and i've got a little room that uh, a sort of a nine by seven foot room that i might uh, turn into a a full scale uh layout oh sounds excellent yeah <laughs> I had a relative who actually he, he had worked on the railways for some years and he actually bought an old rail car, a passenger carriage with all the oh, right. yeah. stripped out of it. And basically the railway ran end to end and around the ends of the, the carriage. It was quite yeah. an interesting way that he'd got it set up. So you could walk right down the middle of it and look at any bit, piece that you wanted to, but it, it's paraded up and down around the, the carriage. So. <laughs> It'd be a great place to put a photo studio in an old. Yeah, place. I agree. I just don't have the space in the the backyard for. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> barely have the space for a model railway in the backyard. Nah, nah. All right. Well, I've uh, got to wrap up shortly, but uh, oh, I've got yeah. a couple more questions for you. Are there any photographers out there that you think should be on the podcast? Uh, you got me off the top of my head. I can't think of any. Um, there's okay. so many. That's the yeah. problem. There's so many. Oof. There, there are some very good one uh, photographers on my Twitter who follow me and I follow them, but yep. I'm terrible with no remembering names, unfortunately. That's so um, yeah, I can definitely forward those to you because there are some extremely good photographers that um, certainly deserve a bit more attention than, than they currently get. Yeah, brilliant. All right, thanks for that. I've got one more question, and it's probably the most important one that I can ask a photographer. Do you like pineapple on pizza? Oh, God, no. <laughs> Definitely not. Definitely not. Okay. <laughs> it's just wrong, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> Some people love it. I'm a neutral. If it's there, I won't pick it off. But if it's not there, I probably wouldn't order it. Yeah. Now, for me, pineapple in a bowl with some cream, yeah, that's okay. okay. But on a top of a pizza, no. Yeah, it's, well, it's... I put grilled pineapple on a hamburger, so, you know. It's... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. It's been absolutely brilliant uh, getting to meet you and learn a little bit more about you. Uh, where can people find your work? Um, I'm on uh, Twitter. I'm on, as we mentioned, on all the social medias. I've got my own website at uh, jasonrowphotography.co.uk. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I've got multiple galleries on there and a learning center and stuff like that. Um, yeah, uh, the YouTube. I'm trying to build a YouTube uh, channel. It's going slowly. People seem to like it, but uh, the algorithm doesn't, unfortunately. So I don't get uh, I know as many views like. as I hope. <laughs> uh, and again, that's Jason Rowe Photography. So, uh, All right, so yeah, that's where they can find me. Thanks again, Jason. Yeah, it's been brilliant. I've really enjoyed it. And, uh, thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Thanks again for listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work in this podcast at grantswinburnphotography.com. I'm also on Vero, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. I'm Grant Swinburne. Hope to see you out shooting soon. Mm -hmm.